My name is Anna Roebuck. I am a PhD candidate with Reiner Lohmann. Um, I'm also a STEEP trainee within the grant program of which Reiner is a director, and I'm also a NOAA Nancy Foster Scholar here at the university. So my research tackles this really broad topic of where PFAS are in the food web, in marine food webs, and I address this by primarily investigating PFAS in surface water and birds. And my research is organized into three chapters, or I would call mini projects maybe. And the first project looks at what PFAS are in these birds that I have collected. I get the birds already dead and I look at PFAS concentrations in their tissues, specifically their liver, and I, I measure them using mass spectrometry and I find, unfortunately, a ton of PFAS in, in their livers. Um, my second project deals with where PFAS go once they're in the bird. So we have all these different tissues with different compositions and so we need to figure out how these compounds want to orient themselves once they're in a living organism. And so that second project looks at PFAS in brain, blood, kidney, lungs, heart, muscle, liver, kind of the works, if you will. And I relate that to changes I see in fats or lipids in those tissues to figure out if there's any association between PFAS and, and changes in, in that given animal. And then my third project is probably the most ambitious, <laughs> but I look at where PFAS are in the food web overall. And so we have these offshore food webs that we rely on for a food and recreation and all these important services, but PFAS love to be in water and so they are also in those marine food webs. And so I use some of the novel detection tools that Steep has refined in addition to sediment and water and phytoplankton and zooplankton and fish and I put that together into a food web model to figure out how PFAS are actually getting in the birds. The birds are at the very top of that food chain and so you create this holistic picture of how the birds are actually getting the levels in them that I measure. So seabirds are a good proxy in some senses for human exposure because we share some similar life history strategies. Um, I guess first and foremost, seabirds can be really long lived. Some of the species I look at can live up to 40 or 50 years. And so over that long lifespan, like humans, they have time to grow, reach sexual maturity, have offspring, this whole kind of development progression. And that development progression changes the way we take up or give off pollutants like PFAS. And so birds go through that just like humans. And so when we look at a bird, we can get a sense of what a human relying on that marine food web is also taking up or, or seeing in their environment as well. Birds are also, they have uh, fast metabolisms like us, so they, they're processing these chemicals readily. They're not stored for a while and, and don't really have to deal with them. Um, they're also very sensitive to their environments. So birds, the, the canary in the coal mine kind of cliche, that's a cliche for a reason, for sure, because they respond on timescales you can readily see to stressors or food shortages or you know whatever it is in their environment that's, that's stressing them out. So my birds are bycatch. I don't kill any birds. I take advantage of stuff that has already died in the environment from monitoring programs. So I kind of, I like to think of it as recycling for a good cause because I'm getting a lot of information from these birds that would otherwise just kind of be tossed. Yeah, I have birds from back all the way to 2007 up to 2018. Uh, I've looked at plastics in them, I've looked at PFAS in them, and data, let's say, forthcoming on some of the PFAS, but they, they're, they're saturated with, with these chemicals, which is un unfortunate. Everywhere I have looked for PFAS in these birds, every tissue I have found it, which I'm happy to have that information, but it also is, is just a, a bummer to, to really think about. The birds that I particularly use, the ones I have the time series for, they live hundreds of miles offshore. They're, they don't even walk very well on land. And so to think that these oceanic creatures are just so, so full of our chemicals is disheartening, but also motivating, I guess. There are so many different sources of PFAS in the environment. and we don't have a lot of great analytical standards to test for all of them. The STEEP group overall looks for a really comprehensive list out of what we can target for. I look for 25 compounds. The postdoc in Reiner's lab looks for 33. I think this is a huge step forward compared to some of the agencies or, or different um, 
institutions who are only looking for about five or six. And so that, that's important. However, there I think needs to be a broader focus to, for industry to share information about what they have to share standards so that we can look at this huge swath of compounds more, I guess, more comprehensively. Um, I think in some of the samples where there's this test that you can look for organic fluorine and you can't say what PFAS it is, but you can say uh, we have X amount of organic fluorine. And in samples where you look for the organic fluorine and then you, the targeted list of you know, 24 PFAS that we're looking for, that 24 list, while I see very high concentrations, it's only making up about 10 to 30 percent of the overall PFAS burden in that given animal. So I'm, I'm looking at a small subset and those concentrations are, are high. And so I, I, I often wonder what the rest of that um, profile, PFAS profile looks like in some of these organisms. <laughs>